to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center, home of the Tina Turner Museum. Caroline, and welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Caroline, before I introduce today's guest, what is something you have discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? This week, I discovered that in the Tennessee room here at Discovery Park, which displays a lot of Obine County history, there are three stained glass windows. And these windows were from the original Union City High School that was actually torn down in 1950. And this was interesting to me because Union City High School is my alma mater. Well, there you go. That's interesting. And I know one of them is dedicated to one of the teachers there at Union City. And she died pretty young, but I thought it was kind of nice that the students all got together and pitched in and raised money to to put a window in her honor there. So, uh, well, thank you for that. Today's guest is Kevin Adelsberger. He's the founder and president of Adelsberger Marketing in Jackson, Tennessee. Welcome, Kevin. Hello. Thanks for having me. Did I did I slaughter your last name or was that uh, close? I, you, I think you got it. I, I actually stopped correcting people um, because I'm from a small town in Illinois originally, and my family's lived there for generations, and they still mess it up on a regular basis. So if West Frankfurt's not going to get it right, nobody else is going to. So so, when you, so so tell us the name of your business so we get it right. Yeah, Adelsberger Marketing. Okay, so Adelsberger I were, Marketing. I think you were on point. Yeah, yeah, I nailed it. I practiced ahead of time. Thank you. So, so back us up. You started You started off telling us a little bit about where you're from. Go back and tell us where'd you come from, how'd you grow up, and what, what uh, led to you working out of Jackson, Tennessee? Yeah, so um, moved around a lot as a child. My father worked for the federal penitentiary system, and to promote within that system, you have to move. Um, helps keep corruption out. And so he eventually got opportunity to go back to his hometown, which is West Frankfort, Illinois. Uh, there was a really, really scary prison near there in Marion, Illinois. That was the Supermax before Colorado uh, became online. A lot of people have heard of the Supermax in Colorado, but uh, Marion had some really nasty folks like John Gotti in it and stuff like that. So is that close to Chicago? No, uh, that's like, that's like, uh, it's like the difference between Memphis and Knoxville. Honestly, it's, okay. it's, uh, it's a whole different state. Uh, and, uh, it's a way it's actually West Frankfurt's only about three and a half hours from Jackson. So, um, it's, it's pretty close to here, but, uh, so moved back to West Frankfurt, which was his hometown. And then I had the, uh, the privilege to get to go to most of my schooling there and, um, live there from second grade until I graduated high school and, did one year of community college and then came to union and uh and then they have not kicked me out of jackson yet now a lot of uh a lot of us when we were teenagers felt like we were in prison um and that our parents were prison guards yours literally was a prison guard uh, did he apply any of his uh career tactics to you as a young man at home uh, there were a lot of things that my father would not tolerate that would have been accepted in other households. So for just one really quick example, my dad worked in the gang unit in Chicago and, uh, and you know, it's a whole different world. I did live in Chicago for a little period of time when I was small. Uh, so like wearing your hat any other way, but straight, uh, <laughs> during his time in the gang unit was like different ways to indicate that you were part of a gang. And so like growing up, like if I was ever caught wearing my hat anyway, but just perfectly straight, I was going to be in trouble. So there was a few things like that, but no, largely he left his work at work, thankfully. And what did your mom do? My mom was uh, blessed to be a stay at home mom and uh, took care of me. And I have a little brother who's about 10 years younger than I am. Uh, and so uh, she took care of me and then took care of him. And then, um, and now she's reentered the workforce now that we've, we've kind of, both been out of the house now. So which, which, who was more strict, your mom or your dad? Oh, definitely my father. Um, at so the different, my mom is, um, I was taller than my mom in about eighth grade. 
And so, and I'm not a very tall person we've met before. I'm not, I'm, I'm like five ten, five eleven, and, uh, she's like five foot tall. And so like, there was just a certain level. She didn't have the fierceness to like be super strict, um, after I got taller than her, you know? Uh, and, and so my father's, my father's, uh, still quite intimidating. Uh, so, <laughs> so you um, still tell the line. Yes, absolutely. So what, what made you choose union? Yeah. So the, the short version is, um, I thought I was going to work in ministry. And so, um, I uh, went to the alma mater that my youth pastor went to. So, um, short version, I didn't grow up in church and, uh, started going to church because my best friend had a crush on the pastor's daughter. That's a true, it's a true story. <laughs> and, uh, and I became a Christian and, uh, thought that I was going to be pursuing ministry as a full-time, as a full-time endeavor. And my youth pastor went to union. Um, and so I went to check it out and loved it and, uh, ended up going to graduate from there. And obviously things have not quite panned out that way. Um, uh, but uh, still involved. My wife and I teach Sunday school and um, we're involved on Wednesday nights and with youth group. And so we're still very involved in church, just not doing it vocationally. So, but that's why we ended up at Union or why I ended up at Union and met Renee there at the time, but loved, loved going to Union and, uh, and glad to, you know, uh, have that on my, on my list of uh, accolades having graduated from there. And so, so that's where you met your wife, was it at college? Yeah. In Greek class, and did uh, she think she was going to marry somebody who was going into the ministry? She uh, she accepted that fact. I mean, she was dating someone else when we met, and so, um, but uh, and she's not here to defend herself. So <laughs> she uh, she uh, broke up with her boyfriend for me is how I tell the story, and uh, and but she thought that was a possibility. But then right around that same time is when I felt like wasn't supposed to be doing it vocationally. Um, and so, yeah, then it just, not removing that from the vocational, there wasn't like something else that filled that gap. And so I was like, I don't really know what I'm going to do. Uh, and, uh, and started working in the nonprofit world. So you, what, what did you get your degree in ultimately? So I actually have a youth ministry degree from union. Okay. I used to not tell people that because people look at you funny. Um, when you tell people you have a ministry degree, um, but now I've had enough success in business that like it doesn't, I don't feel like it holds me back anymore. It's now just a talking spot um, because I feel like when I first started, they're like, okay, who's this guy? I've never heard of him. And he's a youth ministry degree. Like, like I, I even took it off my LinkedIn profile at one point. I said I had a bachelor of arts from union um, and just to, um, but now I feel like it's more of a, a, a humorous sub point in the story. <laughs> Well, you, you, um, your path has taken you to advertising, marketing, communications, production. How do you summarize when you have to tell your grandparents what you do for a living? How do you summarize that? I don't think my grandparents understand what I do for a living. Frankly, I'm not sure that my mother generally understands. <laughs> she knows that I make websites. And so that, that part she's got, my grandparents refuse to get on the internet. And so I'm not sure that a website is super communicative for them, like what we do. Uh, but marketing makes sense. They know marketing. And and so I generally, um, I generally don't pull them into the weeds too much, but um, they, they know that I'm in business for myself and that we've got, now there's, uh, you know, six team members besides Renee and I. And so they're all very excited and proud for proud of me, but um, they don't really have a good grasp on what I do. My brother's in IT. And so he actually has a better idea of what I do on a, on a regular basis and also uses the internet regularly. But <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, I, um, yeah, stick, usually stick to websites is the easy version to tell people. And so, you know, I can tell from following you on Twitter and from seeing all the different that you're fingers are in a lot of pies. Um, what, what is, you know, what is the, uh, what is most of what you do, um, there at Adelsberger marketing, what takes up the most of your, uh, uh business, uh, today? Uh, mostly e emailing people seems to be a lot of what <laughs> I do, uh, professionally, but, um, we, uh, like we tell people that we lead businesses to conquer digital marketing. And so that comes up in a different couple different ways. Uh, we work on websites, as mentioned, and then there's a lot of things that go with the website. If you do it right, there's photography and videography. 
uh, and writing the copy and understanding how Facebook pixels connect to things and um, those types of elements. And so uh, we've recently also started to do more of a um, call it like a CMO approach, like a chief marketing officer approach. So, you know, we do a retainer model with people where I'm acting as their marketing consultant on a regular basis. And, uh, and then we use our services to kind of fulfill those needs. And so we have a bunch of really great customers that we love working with and, um, and get to do, you know, our, my goal is to now find people who are better than me at things that we do and allow them to do them. And then I want to get out. I want to give them as much creative freedom as possible. I want to get out of the way so that they can make great art and great marketing art, you know, um, not just art for art's sake, obviously, but give them an opportunity to be creative and, and uh, you know, do the thing that they're best at. So we're going to talk more about that in a minute, but take me through the journey from youth ministry to yeah. where you are today. It's, it's uh, you know, there is a little overlay, but it's, it's quite far apart. So we, um, my senior year of college, I felt like I wasn't supposed to do youth ministry vocationally, but at that point you're like, may as well finish the degree. I'm um, sure your parents appreciated that. Oh yeah. No, that was not a fun conversation. Um, but they, uh, um, they, you know, it's worked out pretty well so far about actually about eight years ago from our recording of this is when I, uh, decided to quit my, 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 my last real job. So it's, it's gone pretty well, but, um, Worked for the nonprofit world, actually worked at RIFA in Jackson, uh, which is a uh, poverty fighting nonprofit, a hunger fighting nonprofit in Jackson. And during that time, I was the youngest person on staff at the time. And so, you know, 10 years ago, the youngest person on staff got to do social media. That was the that was the, the equation for most businesses. And then I was giving tours um, to volunteers and potential donors and all those kind of things. And I found that I really liked to tell to tell the story of what was happening. Moved to another job, got to do more of that, and then started self or learning myself on how to um, do design and do websites and do different things. And then people had needs and went and filled those needs and and uh, started doing that on the side just because my wife and I were, I don't like to sit still. I have a problem with sitting still. I like to be doing something productive. And so I would just work on stuff on the weekends or at night. Um and uh, and then I was at a nonprofit, which will remain nameless for the sake of this conversation. Uh, and it got real awkward. Like the I'm not a stressed person, but there was so much toxic workplace stuff going on that I was my chest was feeling tight about thinking about work. And the number of times in my life that that is like I have been that stressed about something is almost zero. And so for work to be causing that. Um, it was a, it was a problem. And so, um, I, I had, uh, started doing this stuff on the side, not really seriously. You know, I was just doing a website or a logo for whoever kind of got con contact with me and got so gross there that, uh, they started firing other people in the building that, um, uh, people that I loved and respected and wanted to work with. And so my wife and I had a conversation and I said, Hey, what if I were to quit my job and start doing this full time? And so we talked about it. This is about, I ended up leaving about September, I think, September 1st or so. And uh, um, I uh, uh, said, my wife and I decided like, if we could make it work in a year, I was gonna get a year to see if I could get anything going. And in, in, any, in that, so I tell people if they're starting their own business, like setting a timeline is super helpful because it gives some accountability on whether you're being successful or not. And, um, and so I quit, got to, got to tell, and I didn't tell them off, but had board members <laughs> calling me to try to get me to stay. And I was like, if you fire this other person, I'll stay. And they didn't want to do that. And so, um, who are now business friends, right? So I have business friends that were on the board of the organization that I quit. And so it's kind of full circle, but, um, we, I quit, walked into the co in Jackson, which I know you guys have done a podcast with the co in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, started working out of there. And by Christmas, it was pretty clear that this was going to work. Um, and so that was fortunate. And then, you know, uh, learned how to run a marketing business from scratch 
And because I, you know, my family doesn't work in business. I'm the only real business person in my family. Um, I uh, didn't have any education in this space. My minor was history. So it's not like I was hiding a business minor. I have two ra rather useless degrees unless you're working in those fields. Um, and, uh, and so I uh, started pulling things together and, uh, and Jackson, um, you know, Jackson decided it liked me and uh, I'm thankful for that. Like I won't ever forget, like I'm an outsider in a, in a smaller town. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not Union City, right? But it's, it's, Jackson's not huge. I was an outsider trying to start something new and uh, Jackson decided it wanted me to be around. And so I'm very thankful for that. And we've, we found success doing that. So I want to revisit uh, doing business in a rural community in a minute, but first I want to back up. So what was your first exposure to quote unquote, the internet or, you know, a digital experience online? Cause I'm, I'm a little older than you. So I know what mine was. What was yours? My dad. So my dad loves technology. And so I probably inherited that from him a good bit. Uh, love big Star Trek guy. Like we have, st my parents have Star Trek commemorative plates on their wall. So just like, <laughs> just frame of reference. And uh, he got a computer very early on when personal computers, I mean, this would probably been, I was probably in first, second grade. So like 95, 96 ish. So I know that's not super early on, but that's still pretty early on for like having a computer at in the house that you could do something on. And so I remember that experience and um, playing, you know, Tetris on it. And, and um, I didn't write any programs or anything. I wasn't that kid, but um, we did have the internet from a pretty early age on at the house. Um, and then like, this is, you know, feel free to cut this out later, but like in high school, I actually made money selling pirated CDs. So um, I, I would, I would get a playlist from someone and then I would download the music on one of those pirating services and then burn them a CD and, uh, and make, I think the statute of limitations is run out on that, but let's I, hope so. I do uh, remember and, when, when that was going on a lot and, you know, it, it was a big deal. Um, you know, back when I worked for Elvis Presley Enterprises, it was a big deal. Mm. People were pirating, you know, Elvis tunes and how do you go after people? And yeah, um, it, back back in the day, I can't, it's, you're bringing back memories for me. I can't remember the software and the program that there was one that everybody was using. I'm going to decline to announce <laughs> what I was using just for future uh, liabilities purposes. But, but, you know, so the internet has been like, I grew up with the internet, right? So I was, <clears throat> Facebook became a thing when I was, in high school <clears throat> or became available to everybody when I was in high school. So, you know, I've been molded by the internet. And then it's one of those things where you're like, okay, how do I want to approach this with my children? Um, you know, how much access do I want to give to them? It's, it's a, it's an interesting turn of things to think about after having such an impact on my life, uh, good and bad. And then I'm like, do I want to, how, how do I want to expose my children to that and being able to think through that in a, and I'm going to, I'm going to ask you about that in just a minute. Um, so what, what, at what point did you start working with the internet to a point to where it sparked an interest in you to even think there was the possibility of it being a career? So it wasn't just the internet. It was probably making things, making creative media. I would say probably so like my high school, like I helped start a television show that was uh, short lived and got mutinied quite literally from within the organization. It's a very weird story. Um, and uh, and but there was some experience making stuff there. And uh, and then I made some stuff for uh, the summer before I went to Union and then made some stuff when I was at Union, not as like a program or anything, just as like I'm going to use this. I was, I'm going to use this medium to express this idea. Um, and so not necessarily the internet specifically, but probably um, like, I like to be able to be creative. And so being able to make things um, was what morphed into that. And uh, like one of my first clients was my wife. So at the time she uh, wrote devotional material. And so like, I had to figure out how to lay out a book in InDesign. 
and get it self-published and get a website where people could find it online. And so like little by little, I was problem solving really for a pair of, for a couple who had no money and wanted to try to self-publish this book. Um, you know, those are things that I did to, to kind of really expose, like, it's really more of a desire to make things and create things that have led to this. So you're working with, you know, and have worked with a large number of businesses and organizations that are based out of rural communities. Um, you know, obviously uh, the internet and digital communications has opened up, you know, the whole world where you could actually work for a large business and live in a rural community and work in, what do you think some of the advantages are and disadvantages to running a business out of a, a somewhat rural community. Obviously, Jackson, you know, y'all have a mall. So um, for now, you know, <laughs> right, right. If that's the if that's the measurement, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, advantages are many. Um, relationships are much easier. They're much easier to find the people that you're trying to work with. Um, much easier to build a brand name in Jackson, um, and in rural communities. Cause like, you know, if you, uh, do a good job on something that the public cares about, like potentially everyone in your town that's on the internet will have seen it. Right. So, so there's like, there's a component there where there's some easy to get some recognition. Um, and then, um, you know, I, uh, I'm not from Jackson, obviously we talked about that, but I, I love Jackson. Jackson is my home. Um, and I feel like when we do good projects and we have an opportunity, certain types of projects, we're helping make Jackson a better place to live. And I feel like we can have a real impact on the city uh, by the way we run our business and by the types of clients we work with and, and those types of things. On the flip side, there's like there's some downsides, right? So sometimes talent acquisition can be an issue. Um, which we're we're doing great with. I've got a fantastic team, and we have some great universities in the area that help produce good talent. And um, but and then there's sometimes a limit to the scale and the prices that you can charge. Um, and so you know you've got to find that medium of uh, being affordable to work with people in the area, but then also like there's a premium that's due for these types of services. H how can we? find customers that can do that. And so, you know, I think that's probably a, a trade-off there. Um, but one that, one that we've enjoyed working with so far. Um, we're going to uh, take a quick break, but when we get back, I'm going to ask you about, we talked about children and I want to ask you about fostering. And I also want to ask you about as parents, you know, what do you think we should do about the challenges of children uh, being online? The West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center in Brownsville, Tennessee at exit 56 off of I-40 offers an authentic Southern experience showcasing the history and culture of rural West Tennessee. Inside, visitors can learn about the history of cotton, explore the scenic and wild Hatchie River, and get to know the legendary musicians who called West Tennessee home. Also located on the grounds is Flag Grove School, the childhood school of Tina Turner and the last home of blues pioneer Sleepy John Estes. To learn more about the center, visit westtennesseeheritage.com. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Our guest today is Kevin Adelsberger, the founder and president of Adelsberger Marketing in Jackson. And I'm curious, Kevin, um, you're on the internet a lot. Tell me a little bit about your children, their ages, and what your recommendations are when you're uh, talking to your friends about what do they need to do with their kids and the internet? So I'm on the internet a lot, but you will never see my children on the internet. And there's some reasons for that. So as you mentioned before the break, we're, we have, we're foster parents. Um, we um, came to be foster parents because of uh, we, we saw a need in the community, which, and there's an enormous need still. Um, and during that, during that process, we've been able to uh, adopt two and get guardianship for one. And uh, that process is very interesting in the foster care system because, you know, a lot of times you meet people who've adopted and maybe they've adopted for from Asia or um, or Russia or 
um, you know, Europe or somewhere or, you know, South America, somewhere not here. Um, and, you know, there's, there's no chance of you running into that person's biological family at Walmart. When you adopt through foster care, when you're a foster parent, generally speaking in Tennessee, they try to keep the children in the region that they're from. And, and so, so, you know, our children's biological families are within a, uh, an hour radius of Jackson. And so it's not unreasonable for us to potentially run into one of them in public. And um, is it like an open adoption kind of thing? In t- state of Tennessee, you can have an option either way. Um, and for, for reasons, uh, that I don't really don't need to go into here, but we've uh, ad- elected to not do an ad- open adoption on these. And so, and so, you know, and eventually we feel like, you know, we might run into them and nobody would recognize each other. Right. Um, but, and so we, uh, but, but because we don't put them on the, we don't generally put them on the internet because of, um, they're, you know, potentially one, you know, uh, one round of Kevin Bacon away from, from someone that they know. So, so we, we're kind of weird about that. And so it, it makes us have fun conversations with people like in public events or at church and stuff. And we're like, Hey, you know, I know you're taking pictures. That's great. Just don't put any of ours on the internet if you can. So, um, so the, the, part of the question was the internet component. So yeah, before our, we talk about that, I'm curious uh, about the foster program in Tennessee. Oh, yeah. You mentioned that you mentioned that there is a need still. Um, I'm sure there are people out there who have the thought has passed through, you know, I ought to foster, foster, you know, someone, you know, they've been blessed. They have spare bedrooms. They have a need, you know, they have love to give somebody else. Talk to us a little bit about, uh, what is the foster program? So we fostered through the department of children's services in the state of Tennessee, and there are 8,000 plus children in foster care in Tennessee. And with certain things that are happening in the government, that number is likely to increase in the coming years. Um, foster parents are the way we describe it, people who stand in the gap for children whose parents aren't able to care for them. Um, And sometimes those are systemic reasons that they're never going to be able to do it. Uh, Sometimes it's temporary reasons. And traditionally the goal of foster care is for children to, for parents to get their children back, you know, get enough time to get their stuff together, pass some classes, show drug free, you know, things like that. Um, and, uh, and so you have to have, it's, it's not for the faint of heart. It's a very challenging endeavor, uh, because you are, uh, and, and it's in that frequently, and I, and I don't know you very well, Scott, but a lot of times in the society in the world that me and my friends run in, it's really easy to, to not come in contact with some of the just horrible situations that are happening in our communities. And as a foster parent, you are inviting that horribleness into your life. Not that it's going to necessarily have, you're not going to get like drug exposed or something as a foster parent, but you are willing to take on and love this, this child who's potentially done and dealt with all of those things. And so it's very challenging, but they love, you know, we need more foster parents. We're, we're done. You know, we've, we've, we've hit our, our limit of what, what we can take on, but they need people who, you know, you got to have some flexibility in your schedule because you're going to have to go to court or doctor's appointments or, you know, also meet with parents, uh, biological parents meet with DCS, um, people who are willing to open their homes and know that that kid could leave at any minute, you know, they could be there for a day. They could be there for a year. They could be there for forever. It's a really a, it's a, it's a lot of like, I love details. I don't love details. I love knowing what's going on and knowing that there's a plan and that's not something that jives well with DCS. So um, foster parents are needed um, and you can reach out to DCS. There's also some other organizations like um, uh, the Baptist children's home and a few others that you can become foster parents through, or you can support support foster parents. And so um, my wife is the president of the Madison County Foster Care Association. And every year she uh, has events for foster parents that maybe it gives them a chance to do something fun with their kids that's low cost. 
um, or uh, like they're in the right now we're in the middle of a school supply drive where she gets for pretty much every kid in foster care in Madison County, she gets at least like two sets of uniforms together and the community just donates. And it's amazing to watch. Um, and so there's ways to support foster parents. Um, even if you don't necessarily have the capacity to do it yourself, you can, you can try to support that. Now, uh, in case the foster conversation has led any foster families here to the podcast, I want to make sure everybody knows that foster families get free admission to Discovery Park of America. So there you go. You know, when they're looking for things to do, uh, visiting Discovery Park is a great a, a, a great opportunity for foster families. Yeah, and the the upstairs, the you know the water table in that area, our kids have loved that, and so there's a lot of great stuff for the kids at Discovery Park. And he didn't pay me to say that. <laughs> and we have a brand new water table coming um, in about uh, three or four months. It'll be open. Uh, so you'll have to come back yeah. and visit. Okay. So now let's switch gears and go to – now I have a 24-year-old uh, and a 22-year-old and I'm personally addicted to TikTok. So, you know, I'm sort of in a different area than folks who have younger children who they can – you know, who they're trying to raise um, – you know, what, what's your advice? You're, you're on, you're connected to the internet, you know, a lot. So what is your advice to, to folks trying to, trying to raise children in this world? Yeah. Unfortunately, one of the downsides of my job is that I really have to be connected to the internet on a regular basis. Um, Cause there's times that I'd like to disappear for more than I'm able to. Uh, I, and I'm really in no position to give parenting advice to just about anybody, but our home, we've, we've, uh, you know, we are very slow to introduce technology um, because we, we know that the power that it can have good and bad. We know there's a lot of people out and about that are looking for, you know, looking for children to hurt. Um, and so we, we very slowly now ours are five, five and six. And so we're, we're not, we're not uh, getting in chat rooms or anything yet. Right. But um, which I don't I guess chat rooms probably isn't even, <laughs> I was just, more, thinking, I just dated, I, think, I just dated my I high think, school experience. Yeah. I think that was our era. Yeah. So. You know, uh, and so it, our kids will, um, it'll be a long time before they're on social media. Personally, it'll be a, um, you know, we want to protect them from that. Um, uh, but at the same time, we, we know that we have to have them equipped to deal with the technological world. And so, um, we'll be finding a happy medium of that where, you know, we train them to use a computer and, and, and then it's, it's a tool um, and using it as a tool and not using it as an addiction is really the goal. And I, I'm not a great example of that with my phone, but um, we want, we'll, we'll want them to see it as a tool that they can use to accomplish things as opposed to uh, a dopamine device that uh, many people are given to uh, viewing it as. Yeah. Guilty. It's, it, you know, I, I love, do you, are you on TikTok? I, uh, I observe on TikTok. I don't produce any content, but I, I, I love TikTok. I love, um, you know, I love making the videos for, from Discovery Park and, and I love, I'm getting my news lately from TikTok. It's insane. You know, just, uh, I love the power being in the hands of the people. Yeah. I'm a Twitter addict myself, so. I follow you on Twitter. I'm, you know, Twitter uh, does not give me as much of a, a burst of dopamine as TikTok does because I get lots more likes on TikTok. It's so a mm. Twitter, you know, you post you post what you're having for dinner, nobody likes it, so you don't feel valuable. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do notice that you you do uh, use uh, Twitter a lot, which from a business perspective, you know, I do get a lot of my news on Twitter as well. And if something happens in popular culture or in news, the first place I go is Twitter to yeah. see what everybody else is saying. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's staying up with what's happening. You know, I like to I like to know what's going on. Um, and Twitter's just I feel like it's the best platform for that. Um, and uh, and I don't get irrationally angry about Twitter. I know some people do. And so, like, it's not been affecting me in that way. But if I get on TikTok too early in the day, it will derail my entire productivity for that day. So <laughs> I have to I have to really hold off till the afternoon to to to, to, to dip my toe into that water. Well, so uh, before we go, um, I would love to know uh, for for the small businesses, you know, that are listening 
Um, what's your, what's your suggestion or what's your advice? You know, there's a lot of small businesses that they have a website, they have a Facebook page. Um, you know, they want to hire somebody to handle all that for them. They're so busy. They just never get around to it. Uh, what's your advice for those small business owners working in a rural or in a metropolitan area, you know, who, who, who want to drive business, um, but they're just still not quite jumping in. Well, my, my first place I usually tell people to start is thinking about where their incoming traffic is going. You know, are people who are already looking for you, so high likely to convert to a customer, are they finding what they need to find? Are they seeing the things they need to see to go ahead and be a customer? So I was speaking to a potential client yesterday who um, whose website's horrible, and he knows it. And he's like, I just don't know if I need to invest in it. I was like, well, if people are window shopping between you and this competitor, how's that going to go? And he's like, oh, yeah, that's not. Okay, give me a price. So so I, I think it's helpful to think from the customer's perspective, if I'm coming to see your place, am I getting the information that I need to know? You know, it's like if I went to the Discovery Parks website and you didn't have your hours on there, like I'm not going to look real hard. I'm gonna like, okay, maybe the Pink Palace or the zoo has the hours on their website, right? Like I need to find the things I need to know very quickly. So when you approach those type, that's like a great place to start is are people able to find the important information that they want to know, not necessarily all the things that I want to promote? Um, and, uh, and, you know, in a lot of marketing where that's called inbound marketing. And so are we, are we taking care of the inbound marketing is a great place to start. Fantastic. Thank you so much for take. I know you've got deadlines um, right now. And so thank you so much for making us one of your uh, things on your list today to take care of. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for the time, Scott. And uh, I'll next time I'm up up in Union City, I'll give you I'll give you a shout. You got to come see the new water table. Thanks to all of you listeners who've joined Kevin, Caroline, and me today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. <laughs>